here at Kennel Vale, a Cornish Wildlife Trust Reserve, a few miles from Penryn campus. Otters, dippers and kingfishers are just a few of the species that make up the incredible diversity of flora and fauna that use this site. This is the site of a derelict gunpowder factory that's long been abandoned, but now nature has reclaimed this ancient woodland. Hi, I'm Billy. I'm Ellie. And I'm Ben. And today we're going to be talking to you about colonising bees, a reintroduced mammal and migratory birds. All of this to come on Series 2 of Nature Watch. Autumn brings with it a whole host of migratory birds, many of which will be settling in the woods around us. For bird watchers like myself, this brings a great opportunity to get a closer look at these species. It's early morning here on Penryn campus. It's autumn and thousands of birds are arriving from Scandinavia, even more heading on down to Africa. A lot of these are overwintering in places like Cornwall, and here on Penryn campus we've got a fantastic array of habitats which support them. One of the ways that we can study these birds is by carrying out a scientific procedure called bird ringing and that's what I'm going to be showing you this morning. So we set up a couple of mist nets earlier today and I'm just going to go and check them to see what we've got. So I just caught this robin in the mist net here um, and we're going to take it back and take some measurements and put the ring on. Um, mist nets are one of the commonest net ways that we catch birds. Um, it's just a very fine mesh strung up between two poles and the bird flies in and just sits in this pocket like this. Um, and then we come and very carefully extract them and put them in these little bags where they're nice and stress-free and calm. All right, let's go and have a look at it. So the basic principle of bird ringing is putting an individually recognizable tag on the bird's leg. That means that if we catch it anywhere else, we'll know exactly where it's come from, what age it is, you know, all those sort of details. So here's the tag itself. It's a very small aluminium ring with a unique alphanumerical code on it. Now the ring you put on the bird depends on the size of the bird obviously because you don't want it to come off the bird's leg. But what we use are these ringing pliers to put them on. So here's a donut, we just caught it in the last net round. So just do a gentle squeeze, first squeeze to get it on and then a second squeeze to close it so it's nice and safe. So once we put the ring on we want to find out a few details about the bird itself. So first of all we want to age it try and use different plumage features, bare parts, colour of the eye to find out how old it is in the first place. Then we want to take a few measurements and find out what condition the bird is in. So we want to look at fat and muscle and we want to take a wing measure and also weigh the bird as well. So all these details that we're getting and noting down are going to be sent off to the national database for the ringing scheme which is run by the British Trust for Ornithology and that allows coordination over national and international levels so that if these birds are caught anywhere else in the world know about it and the data will get back to us. So Ben, it's great to see the benefits of bird ringing. Yeah, I mean it's brilliant because it allows us to gain an insight into the lives of these species at an individual and population level. That's right. So from the bird to the bees, there's one particular species that you wouldn't expect to see at this time of year and I went on a mission to find it. As we approach autumn, the air begins to get a lot quieter as bee species are dying off or hibernating. However, today we're here in Bizzo, where there's one species of bee which is active from September to November, and the ground here is filled with their nests. This is the ivy bee. As their name suggests, they feed off pollen produced by ivy. Although they look similar to the familiar honeybee, ivy bees don't actually have a queen and work a based social system. They're solitary bees. Each nest is actually the work of a single pair. The tunnels go down 30 centimetres into the earth where larval cells are nourished, ready to develop into fully grown adults in the following year.
When a female is ready to mate, she produces pheromones, which attract multiple males. The males swarm around her, forming a copulation cluster. After being described as a distinct species by science in 1993, they appeared in southern Britain for the first time 15 years ago, having migrated north from the continent. Since then, they continue to grow in numbers over here every year, and with a warm, mild climate, Cornwall is perfect for them. At a time when many of our pollinating insects are dramatically declining, it's wonderful to know that the ivy bee is thriving. It's brilliant to see a story of optimism when so many bees are facing catastrophic declines. Yeah, definitely. The colonisation of ivy bees is a great success story. And now from one new species in the UK to one that has just made a welcome return. Recently, the beaver has been officially relisted as a native mammal in Scotland. And although this has not yet happened in England, we went up to Devon to discuss the recolonisation of beavers in the West Country. Go back a few hundred years and the wildlife you'd find outside your back door would mostly be familiar, but with a few obvious exceptions. One in particular was this fella, the European beaver. The European beaver is the world's second largest rodent and is capable of holding its breath for up to 15 minutes. They can live for 10 to 15 years and they will reproduce every year having two to three kits. They want such a common sight in the UK that we even named our towns after them. Beaverly, for instance. Now, unfortunately for the beavers, we saw them as walking department stores. Their watertight fur made fashionable coats and hats. Their meat was apparently very tasty and they produce castorium in their glands. Now, castorium is a chemical compound which they ex extracted from their food, willow, and it's basically aspirin. Beavers are also incredible ecosystem engineers, as I found out when I visited ecologist Derek Gow at his property near Launceston, where he has a group of semi-wild beavers. So, could you tell us, what have the beavers been doing in this area? Well, they've been building very many dams, they've been cutting down trees, they've been doing exactly what beavers do. Awesome. So what roles will beavers play within, within their environment? Well, what they do is they basically they open up um, woodlands to sunlight and what you end up with is a community of vascular plants which respond to that sunlight. Mm -hmm. And there are very many with pollens, there are very many with fruits. And as a result, you have a, a changing guild of wildlife responding to that. In addition to that, when they're building dams, what the dams do is they retain water in the environment. That water is at different temperatures, different te depths, different velocities. Uh, and again, you have a whole panoply of different species that exploit the different microhabitats mm -hmm. that, that, that emerge as a result of that process. Awesome. So they played a massive service for the environment. It's, uh, they're a hugely significant animal. And with the service, do you reckon that as people, uh, particularly in Cornwall, could we live alongside them happily? We could live alongside beavers happily without any great problem at all, but you've got to bear in mind this is an animal that has, has been largely gone from this landscape, more or less since, since the Bronze Age. So even though they lingered on until maybe the, the late 16th century, it's an animal that people are utterly unfamiliar with. So when we start to talk about people living with beavers, what you have to do is you have to prepare for a process which is, is one essentially of relearning. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we could do it. Yes, it's all perfectly possible. But at the end of it all, to have this animal living in a landscape with us, we have to show a degree of tolerance, respect and understanding. Gotcha. That's awesome. Fingers crossed we can, because just seeing the, the habitat here and just actually experiencing the natural wild beaver would just be truly, it would be really special to see. Be nice to think so. Right, so whatever the future does hold for beavers in Britain, one colony has already become established here, right here in the West Country. And earlier this month, the Nature Watch team went down to the River Otter and filmed the first wild beavers since the 1600s. At 32 kilometres long, the River Otter runs through Somerset and Devon, and we joined it in Otterton. The area had all the hallmarks of beaver activity, but the animals themselves were proving elusive. However, we did spot several species that also rely on these waterways and benefit from the beaver's presence. And then, as the sun started to set in the distance, the beavers emerged onto the bank. Just as twilight turned into darkness and the 
team were preparing to pack up and leave, we retreated to an unexpected final view.